Starting Good Day World May 15 Open Source Ecology Developers Meeting. We've got some few good things to discuss today, so please take a look at the meeting agenda for today, pasting into the, the working document. Okay, um, so on my side, let's see, the, the, actually this, this graph here is old. Um, let's get the updated graph on the, on the arrows, our, hours worked by everybody. Uh, let me share my screen here so everybody sees what I'm looking at. Okay, here's our development hours graph here. Let me just paste that into the document. Keeping track of that. So I'm still looking forward to having that increase significantly as we go into the weeks forward. So with immersion program planning, announcement is almost out. I mean, wow, it took me a long time to uh, actually organize. In terms of writing the curriculum for both the immersion program and a boot camp. So what's going to happen is, uh, so if you look at, oh, let's see immersion, you can click on that, look at the, the wiki page for that. Uh, the, there's a video that's up and that's that's all good, that's that's all done. Uh, there's a section on the OSC boot camp, which is actually the first week of the five week program. So it's something where if you don't want to take the full program, and get really but still get very much immersed in all that we do we cover a lot of stuff it's uh, very exciting uh, covering the open source microfactory and if you look at the the open source microfactory bootcamp curriculum you will see some pretty impressive things in there uh, so you can go through that here's one highlight uh, did you know that so so the laser small laser cutter is part of the the open source micro factory just a simple diode laser that fits on the d3d platform the universal access platform but in studying for you know what do we do with larger power lasers it turns out that carbon dioxide laser tubes are actually uh, not difficult to make and you can even uh, the, the most difficult part is aligning a little mirror that get that you use there but all the parts are already have readily available and you can be as simple as making one out of PVC pipe well ladies and gentlemen that's what we'll do in a boot camp we'll do a simple experiment which should take an hour or two of of, um, of, of actually doing that so that's one one crazy example of what will happen and otherwise uh, getting hands on all the machines uh, building a 3d printer uh, working with the circuit mill working with the filament maker the idea of the fu full closed loop cycle of, of starting with scrap plastic making filament printing um, all of that that's going to be covered and as far as the larger immersion training that's uh, you can click on the curriculum down at the bottom of the page uh, immersion program curriculum and that's uh, I'm aiming to finish that up today and, and hopefully post like today or so. Uh, but it's, it just takes time because really setting um, setting very clear learning goals for what, what, what really does it take for somebody to, to pick up on being able to work with OSC full time to develop as well as to run workshops. So there's training both on the technology and also some leadership and, and how do you teach effectively how do you run a workshop like that so a lot of elements go into that um, so besides the OSC immersion program uh, there's a bit of the uh, I don't know if you've seen on on a micro track the, the just been running that lately uh, take digging that into the ground but there's a little video if you go to the OSC workshops Facebook page which shows the micro track doing some digging in a garden basically making these growing beds 
as you can see here. Uh, so I, I broke the thing. Uh, I actually ended up breaking the thing. So um, there's a big weld that came off, so I got to fix that up. Uh, but that was kind of funny, actually. It was one of those things where, as we remounted, the, like during the build itself, we basically had to cut the frame apart and then re-weld it because the motors wouldn't fit. And that's that's the part that actually broke right now. But I've been running that for last week, just just filling up these beds as you see here. Uh, pretty nice. I mean, the machine works works well, but it's it doesn't have enough turning ability. Like it, it's hard to turn, so it needs more torque. That could be addressed by several means, like like one is shorten the tracks, getting a little higher pressure on the pump, and and doing a smaller drive cog on the on the drive track. But other than that, I mean, it works well. But it's man, it, the thing is rough. To, you stand behind on it, and it kind of shakes you around quite a bit. So I'm I'm thinking about like what in the future, what do we do? It's like suspension for little tractors, even like that. I don't know. I have to think about that for the future. Um, but yeah, that's that's the uh, little things here. My my full effort is on the immersion and getting all the printers and and upgrades on the printers. Uh, so I think by this year we want to upgrade to there's there's these other uh, more advanced drivers that fit on the ramps board and Marlin actually supports that. Uh, but you can look at uh, Trinamic uh, Trinamic drivers. Uh, those are a snap-in replacement for the Pololu drivers on the ramps, the RepRap Arduino Mega Pololu Shield that we currently use. So these are a snap-in replacement. But the very amazing thing about it is when you snap those in, uh, and they're a little more instead of like a couple of bucks each, they're like 10 bucks each, and there's four of them, so four or five. So forty or fifty dollars instead of like ten or twenty dollars to for the stepper drivers, but the beautiful thing about them, the way their logic inside works, they're able to be absolutely silent. So if you've ever heard a three D printer, it makes quite a bit of noise, but these things are absolutely silent as far as the electronic side, no humming. So all you would get is like any mechanical noise, but not but the electronic noise is completely eliminated. Because printers typically hum around, like they almost sing to you. They're quite loud. Uh, but the other thing is, for this, and Marlin supports this out of the box, is you can set simply enable and stop less homing. Wow! All it does is by it basically goes, it rams into the end, and it detects the fact. From from what I understand, it detects the fact that it hits something because it senses the current inside the little driver so it stops and you don't need an end stop a physical end stop the the little electronic component that we right now use with a 3d printed part and it's magnetically attached to the to the to the axis so further further part count reduction so this is awesome just uh, making the machine ever simpler and so forth so that's my report um, so other people let's see what we have here so um, I, I was going to actually ask Ruslan, so so for the immersion program, um, either myself or somebody else like Ruslan or somebody uh, who knows how to work with the workbenches and program them, we're going to have a little little school on that for everybody because I think as a team we want to get much more familiarity with that. So I was actually going to ask if, um, I don't know what you, what you have to report on Ruslan today, but can we maybe talk a little bit about um, the 12 step process? Uh, started on page three. <laughs> okay, now let's talk about what the just the conceptual framework of how you go about programming in FreeCAD. Because what we know so far is that when you when you install new workbenches, they end up showing up in the mod folder on your on your computer. It's just a folder. You navigate to that, and you see the new workbench. If some if some workbench is in that new folder, it appears in your FreeCAD interface in your dropdown for all the all the workbenches. So, um, <clears throat> let's talk about that. Let me let me see here. Just organize that here. 
Uh, Ruslan, so can you can you tell us a little bit more about it? So say say we take a look at the the D3D workbench. Okay, I'll open up FreeCAD just to kind of follow up with this. But we already have a D3D workbench that's partially functional. Um, so what are all the steps we need? What if we can we go as simple as look examining the code and and observing in there? Because what you got to do is you got to modify the interface. You got to put an icon for whatever you want to do. You want to substantiate that icon with some actions that are programmed in Python within the the workbench file itself. But um, let's see. So for example, you know, you go to the so there's, say there's the D3D printer workbench. Looks like this. Hey, we've got this little icon here where supposedly it's supposed to do some actions. So you click on this icon, and what does it do? It created a part somewhere, but I'm not sure if anything got created here. Um, oh no, but there's the frames. The frame icons are here. Uh, I believe this one works. We can create a frame. Look at that. Add a frame. This is. Oh, you can't. Let's see what happened here. Now you see it, maybe. Bandwidth problems. Yeah. Um, so if you look into, so you know, there's a, there's a, we clicked on a button within FreeCAD. Uh, so here we click on this one, and we can generate a frame. So there's code running on this that that connects to this button. But how, let's understand it a little more. So so exactly how do we do that? Uh, what are the steps? So. We, so you got some black magic. So so here you go. I click OK on this, um, and it's waiting a little bit. Hey, look at that! We created a. No, it's a little misadjusted, but we created a frame. So, okay. So what are? Let's talk about the steps that that happened there. Um, okay, there is a special workbench, a very minimalistic uh, workbench uh -huh. made by Steve. Okay. And yeah. Button, yeah. And you have a circle inserted in the workbench. It's very small. The, the code is very small uh -huh. compared to, uh, to all other. Yeah. You can, uh, I think uh, it's possible to extend or to replace things uh, step by step. Uh, yeah. Exactly like you were just trying. For example, you can begin with small things like changing an icon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Um, let's see. Uh, can you paste in the link for everybody in the working document to to his code for that? Yep. And that is called. So we've seen this before. This is some of the original work from Stephen that which which Ruslan that then took to continue on developing the three D printer workbench. Let's see. Do I see that in my Sketcher spreadsheet should robot inverse and points plot apart. Inspection image fasteners draft arch complete. I don't see it in here. What is it called? Uh, Example workbench, is that it? Example, yes. Yeah, okay. So yeah. So you can go to the I have posted on the slide seven workbench starter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we've got. Yeah, yeah, that's excellent. Um, sorry, where is that link there? Workbench starter. Uh, slide number oh. seven. Slide number seven. Oh, okay. By the way, when, when I when I watch the videos, you know, I noticed that uh, my voice is very low. Or yeah. Oh, right now, yeah, I can hear you pretty well. Yeah. Okay. It should should be okay. Um, Otherwise, I can adjust. Yeah. No, you're you're pretty good. So yeah, so we go to the GitHub of Steven, and you can install this. Uh, so let's actually take a look at it. Can we do that? So. Yes, you should probably do it. Right. So. On the GitHub repo, we've got 
so how does so if you go to github this is just like entry level exploration here uh, we, we navigated to this starter workbench so which which is the actual main file that we need so we got I see a number of files um, so which file is the actual one? In it GUI.python? Yes. So this is one where everything starts. Okay. And this Python little module, it will call on these other Python modules, which are like OSC base, OSC command button. Uh, I think yes. Okay. Well, let's take a look at what what uh, the, the starter workbench does and if we can make any sense out of it. Okay. Um, so, example workbench for OSC part design. So you do some initializations. Um, so, for example, like the icon itself, where do we? Where is that executed here? Okay. Um, you have in the function initialize. You still there? Uh, I'm still there. I, I just forgot it. Uh, sorry. So much time passed in my last development. Yeah. It was like yesterday. Oh, actually, it was yesterday. Um, I think first you do an initialization, then you need to go. Um, Mm-hmm. So you have this import, mm -hmm. import OSC base and then you have OSC command button. Uh, and this OSC command button adds some buttons. Mm-hmm. And that let's see. Okay. Yeah, so, okay, so we've got the command, OSC command button dot pi. Okay, now, now I see it again. Uh-huh. And um, what happens when you go import, then uh, at the very end of the file, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, class is initialized. That means what you see uh, at the... Uh, Uh huh. You create this class with the name OSE command button class. Mm hmm. And it, uh, it have a, has a couple of uh, uh, functions which you, you, you can extend. For example, the function get resources, it must have this name get resources precisely like, like it is with case sensitive. Then probably pre-get will. And it has a path to, to the button image, Pixmap. Uh huh. Pixmap. And where is that coming from? So, so uh, where is that SVG file actually located? So, so for example, say we want to create a button and create a different button. Yeah. And you need to go to another file with the name OSD base to find out what is OSD base icon path. Okay. So let's go to to OSC base.py. So it's got icon path. So this is within like uh, the existing distribution of FreeCAD, like it has this resources and icons. Uh, this is 
Uh-huh. Let's see. Um By the way, I have the same directory in my workbench. That means in my case you go to voice e workbench slash resources slash icons. Okay. Let me see if I can find that. So resources. So for example on GitHub here, like where do I find that? Where is that actually? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Ah, there you go. Uh, what's what's in the readme? I don't see much outside of just these basic installation instructions. Right, right. This, this. Are you talking about installation? Yes. Okay. So this is just. It doesn't matter if you will look at uh, in web or on your directory after you install it. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that's that's good. So essentially, we're saying, okay. So you know, just to kind of break this down here. So we've got your workbench starter. You've got a few files. You got the actual icon, the actual graphic for that icon that we press in resources icons. Um, what is this git git ignore? Um, it's a list of files or extension. There is a uh, um, which um, tell to cheat what the files it will ignore. Ignore files that are. Oh, example. If you uh, use Python, uh, uh, if you start the Python code, uh -huh. then, uh, uh, comma, uh, then Python will create a file with extension EYC. Uh, this is a temporary file. I think it's, it's to speed up uh, the execution of. Uh, the, Okay. Uh, and uh, GitHub will trace changes in the directory. For example, you change a file, and we'll uh, show you uh, that you changed, what you changed, and then you can um, share the change with other people. And because uh, Python created a lot of temporary files, uh -huh. you will, uh, and without even knowing files, uh, GitHub will just Okay. So this is uh, unique to the Git ignore. Is that unique to Python codes, or is it like in C or? Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So it's just little workings there. And copying. What's copying uh, folder? Oh, just okay. Okay, that's license information there. 
what's this copying lesser? Lesser. So are we doing like a, okay, let's lesser, lesser GPL. Okay. Oh yeah, that's the template. That's standard usage uh, within FreeCAD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So we had the initial init GUI.py, OC base, which we call OC command button.py, and README. Uh, README just contains the installation. Okay. Um, so in a typical FreeCAD file, like for example, in your other workbench on a piping, you have CSS files within a, your directory, correct? No, actually you put the CSS, that's once you put the CSS files. No, no, CSV, sorry, CSV. They go into, like, you couldn't put them into the Python codes themselves? You wanted to separate them, or is, is that a choice, or you have to separate? Okay. You took it out? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And for a for a typical program, do we how many different Python code modules do we need? Like here we have only three. Uh, is that typical for FreeCAD workbenches, or typically there's many more? Yeah, but in principle, you can put everything into one Python file. Uh, this is true. Mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, uh, this would have some disadvantages. For example, uh, sometimes I store a, a function outside of it good, uh, because I want to use them in different work page. And in case of uh, 3D, uh, in the work page, this is precisely what happened. Okay. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think here we have a basic introduction to how you can do your first program in um, in FreeCAD. I guess one one simple exercise would be, ooh, we can change the icon or possibly add another icon. But but yeah, like basic entry level exercise: change the icon and attach a function to that icon. So let's actually go through that. So so we saw, okay, we can probably change that icon by what we just talked about. Uh, what about the action? Let's talk about the action that is attached to that icon. So uh, we would go, I would go into init GUI. Uh, so we, we did that. We have the button here. So where's the actual activation of that button? Yeah, so here it is, right? Activated. So if whatever you put in the code there, that's the action that will take place. Which right now... Uh, yeah, right now it's blank. It's got uh, just this... Just... Oh, oh, oh! So this this activation here is the activation of the the workbench itself. Okay, so we need to go OSC command button and see what's the code that that's in there for. Okay, so we have this command to add the printer frame. Let's say. 
Um, okay, so here, whatever code is executed when you click on it is in here. So def activated. And what's it doing right now? It says workbench is working. Uh, let me see if that's what happens. So, oh yeah, that's okay. So that's that's good. Um, oh, it's supposed to draw a circle. So let's see. I mean, let's see if that actually works. So if you go to the exact, so let's create a new file, example workbench, and then I press on this part right here. Create a new part and make it active. So I click on that and I saw it generate a part. But I don't see it. Where Where is that thing? Um, yeah, is it supposed to be working or why am I not seeing it? View. I typically do view, standard views, and fit all. I'm not seeing it show up. Yeah. Uh, do you see any result or? Windows. Let's see the. An example workbench it adds the printer frame. Oh, I guess I have the upgraded version, not 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 Stevens, but the one where you started putting in the the frame. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, let's see. But it did the circle. Let's see if when you do that, standard view fit all. Oh yeah, there we go. Ladies and gentlemen, we have done it. So we kind of seen how the source code which is on github there which adds that circle i guess um what's happening technically on my screen that that should have happened when i press the left button on the left hand side here if you can see that right that was probably steven's original but then i think ruslan you added this frame button right uh, yes, yeah uh Sounds like it. Um, but anyway, we when, when I clicked on that frame button, we got this circle to show up. So that's a first example of something, uh, how we can make things work in a very simple FreeCAD workbench. So the general idea is... I need to correct. I didn't, put, uh, I didn't change the example workbench. I changed uh, the workbench with the circle. Yeah. Yeah, I think I Okay, okay, that might that's that might have been. Uh huh. Yeah. No, that that actually makes sense. So get resources. It actually said uh, draw the the style wireframe SVG. Okay. Um, that's okay. And then activate it. It does the actual circle there in this code right here. Yeah. No, this is good. This is good. So so I mean we have a little template. For example, if we replace this circle here. Uh, this code for the circle with some more advanced stuff like say we wanted to insert our universal universal axis piece or something well i mean say it again and yeah 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 no that the devil's in the details but um, what we're showing here is that we can do a simple circle function as a start and then we can get better. Okay, what if we want to do a real object? I mean, obviously we need to get into more detail. But the principle... Yep. Yeah. Line 
Uh -huh. And the next step, you, you uh, write a macro, which will ex execute, which makes the same. Uh -huh. Okay. And then you have all, all, all the four ways how to do the same thing. Yeah, and then uh, at that point you can put multiple buttons and each does a certain function and you can be well on your way to designing a full workbench for some new machine. So that's excellent. So this is even better than I thought because now you just told me that we only need four or five steps to create a new workbench. That's great! Okay, so workbench design in FreeCAD in four steps. So that, that, that's actually a good, good practice. So, so steps to experiment with workbenches. Now my work is done. I, I can, uh, you can retire. I love it, I love it. This is great. Okay. Yep. S steps to experiment with when creating um, when creating workbenches. So yes, uh, this is also important to, to know all the other possibilities because you can uh, switch between them. And for example, if you have some uh, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was the first thing is uh, is the command free can cons free can command line? Was that number st step number one? You mean just use one of the functions? Like just use an existing workbench? Yes, just keep it around and play with it. Uh-huh, yep. It is uh, when you do it, the Python console automatically will display function, Python functions, which you forget to use when you turn to create stuff. For example, if you, if you create yeah, yeah. No, that's that's right. Right. That's that's exactly right. That's you can basically re reverse engineer what Python is doing to to do some command, and that is where do we see the Python console? Is it under Windows? No, uh, Python console is under view. Workbench, toolbars, panels, 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 Python console. Okay, yep. So go to view, panels, Python console. Yeah, that's excellent. That's that's uh, that's a way to start learning. So we see what commands actually happen when you do something. So for example, you know, say I go into a regular workbench such as the standard sketcher, right? And I say I try to draw draw something like so I just open a new document sketcher, I have to select the start an XY plane for example. Uh okay. 
Right, so for example, just to activate the <clears throat> the sketch window, uh, there's a whole bunch of commands in there in Python. Um, yeah, and and is it pretty accurate to say, like, for example, if just now I opened up a, a Python window like that, uh, and say I draw a line, or let's see, yeah, the circle. I think the sketch, the sketch is uh, pretty complex. Yeah, it's complex. Uh, with, with part. Yeah, let's go to part. part. Yeah, so say we're in part workbench, I want to do a little cube. Yeah, so it did that. So, yeah, so activate workbench blah 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 cube yep yeah mm -hmm. yep okay like for example if I do position axis and position I cannot change the size here, can I? Place. Oh wait, yeah, oh okay. Right, thank you. Uh, so I go to the cube. Oh yeah, there you go. So cube for example, like height, let's say I change it to one, like that. Yeah, there you go. So free cat get document unnamed get object box height equals 25.4 millimeter. Okay. Yeah. Um, and untie that the same line. Just. Uh, I think uh, you can. Uh, you can so if I type in. So if I type in the same, but do like 250. Yes. No, I got an error already. You have a white space in front of a free cat. Uh, oh yeah yeah yeah. Uh, can you use your upper arrow on a keyboard? Oh, I see. I see. Um, yeah, so I'm going to do 257 millimeters. Look at that. My first ever command line um, elongation of a cube. <clears throat> so that's that's what happens. Yeah. And then, so say you did this in a program uh, where you clicked on that button to generate this tube like this, then it would probably still be editable in the properties value, right? Because it will probably retain the properties that it has. Yeah. Yep. Flexible. Yep. Excellent. Well, so so there we go. We have some examples. So so we went to the Python console. We experimented a little bit with command line of how you can actually draw some things. So that's the console right there. Then do a macro to do the same thing, and then write the Python module. So so for the macro, how do you actually record a macro here? Yeah. Okay. So we're in a new document. And then we go to macro. No, 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 no. How do we do it? Uh, you have a new document. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you have um, on the upper part of the window where you select the webpage part. Right from, from this uh, comment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, circle, which is recorded. Yeah. Name okay. So sample. Then record. S yeah. Hit record. Okay. And now do something. For example, create a box. Okay. So say I'm gonna create a box, and then I'm gonna create uh, uh, yes. this. Okay, and then change uh, something. Uh, a dimension or okay, change. so for example, I'll make that height, for example, five for the for this. Okay, so I oh yeah, I did something, made it really long. Yeah, I did that. So then I'm gonna hit stop. Yeah. 
Okay. So now what happens? How do I use these? So now macro, I go to macros and it should have sample. Uh, so let's see. Let, let's open up a new work, new space. So let's see if it does that. So macro, macros, sample, execute. Wow. Wait, but it didn't do that last thing where I changed the dimension though. See, but that's that's very useful though. That's great. And and the macros. Say it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then we go to macro, macros, sample macro, and then edit, and it, that's what it does. That's excellent. So what we have here is some very powerful functionality, which well, for like. Example, you see here, get object called height. Yeah. Uh, yep. Or height. Or height. Yeah. Six. Let's see macro. Yeah, I don't know. I gotta save it. Control F six. Yeah. Okay, I can hit play on that and let's see it. How about this? You just run it here. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep, it's open there. Yeah, I see it. So close out of it. Just close it. No, don't close it. It's better to keep it open when you experiment with stuff. But you can run it uh, when you click a button in the toolbar. Yep. It goes to a recording button. It's not a red circle, but a green triangle. Uh, yeah. So if I play it, what happens? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. So if I play it, see it ran it, but I I don't see any result though. It didn't open up a new. Maybe I need to open up a new window. Yeah, it put it into the other window that was open. Oh wow! Yeah, look at that. It. Yeah. I suppose in your macro there is a command to select an active document. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we don't have to get into the details because we're running uh, a little long here. But yeah, this is um, this is good. Just just kind of getting familiar with the way we can start programming within FreeCAD. Uh, I think that's a good overview. But let's maybe start stop here since we've got other people to go. Uh, but thank you for that uh, that excellent four step game plan. For creating macros uh, and programming, well, program starting to program new new workbenches, yeah, that's excellent. Um, yeah, so for anyone who wants to start playing with that, that's 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 that. And I think the the most interesting part is once we get a hand, handle of that uh, workbench where you have simply nice a bunch of really nice buttons. Or you can you can create just about anything. Imagine, for example, that for every single GVCS machine, we would have a whole bunch of parts upstairs here, like all nice graphic parts that literally become a visual design language.
before making new iterations or new versions of, of some kind of a, a machine. Like if you have a menu of all the parts, think about how much time it saves, like say compared to the part library on the wiki, where you, you first have to download a part, then you have to import it into FreeCAD and so forth. But we have a workbench that does that, it could really facilitate design to, to make it democratic or publicly accessible where people just average people can can be looking at making real designs and of course you have to have knowledge of how how some machine goes together and that comes from design guides that we can publish uh, but the parts the good thing about the the workbenches themselves is that the parts are already correct so all that hard work of getting it to a correct part has already been done so this this could be it's really about kind of like the building blocks of civilization some people have already done the hard work and say engineering the part and now you can use it but you can modify it within FreeCAD uh, you can pull it into a working document readily so yeah very powerful functionality so let's leave it at that and move on to to Abe and thank you Ruslan that's that's pretty good um, Abe uh, do you want to continue oh wow look at that some further upgrades Abe can we have you uh, pipe in now yes can you hear me okay yep yep go ahead okay uh, let's see I think I'll share my screen uh, yeah I've been, I got a few updates on uh, the, the uh, power cube done our levels to the frame and I kind of went ahead and separated that off into a, kind of a separate module a lot of the problems I was having with the slowness and bugs in, in FreeCAD were really related to the assembly workbench and the constraints. Some stuff had built up, mm -hmm. and um, the, there was some bug there. Uh, assembly to workbench, I, I, I kind of hope that we can deprecate that soon. Um, I think it. Yeah. Or some of it is also just depending on how we do the FreeCAD. Um, I'm closing it out. I have some issues going back and just editing some of the, the complexities to this ball valve part. I'm trying to edit some plumbing parts now um, to uh, move on with the assembling those parts in the, in the, uh, in the whole uh, assembly of the power cube. So, power cube 11, but I've got. Yeah. last time to the, the front grate and uh, there could be more changes there made. Hopefully the frame is the way I've got the frame imported as a separate module. I'm hoping that it's pretty easy to edit. It should the way I imported it with the uh, assembly tool workbench is still what I'm using because I'm in FreeCAD legacy still um, just because that's what we know how to use or I know how to use right now. Mm -hmm. um, so the frame that I did those notches on the side. I might have to do some, to do some more of that up above. But not just so that the engine should be able to shift it back and, and move it in and out from the sides uh, with the bottom of the frame kind of notched out there. And let's see, I, I reconstruct some of this plumbing stuff. I was having issues, but I still got to redraw some parts that I didn't work work plumbing, finish, ball mm -hmm. and so on. Um, yeah, I think I the plumbing better and I, I am curious to see a lot of this plumbing specification stuff uh, I think last time was one was the one that was talking about the plumbing specs for standards and things like that news so some of this stuff is online and there's the details on the what happened to the see are you looking at the same version I am um yeah I kind of oh oh I see I see what's going on there's something else in the background okay yeah so yeah, I did the sides, the front, and now we're going to have the plumbing. The, the, this is the standards plumbing. I mostly go based off of what I find online. And most of that is for the precision parts. It's like the threads and that kind of thing. And I think part of the problem is that there isn't necessarily specific standards. Manufacturers probably, you know, they, they have loose standards for, for making certain types of pipe probably different specifications, but the interconnects, the threads are the main thing that are specified, and the rest of it is kind of more loose. So I just kind of estimate some of the 
pipe stuff based off of the thread size and so on. Because that's what we're working with, even though I'm not displaying any threads. And there's no options for that. Like, I was wondering about the two at the fastener workbench. You know, there's the options for the threads and things on the um, on the pipes and so on. And I wonder if that could be implemented, even though I don't think having threads is a priority. But if, if we're going to draw some of these parts in, in a workbench from from just programming, then uh, it's a need to have the standards, you know, kind of specified between between the thread uh, and, and just what what is built. If there's some kind of average that that standard needs to be considered, if we're not going to draw it with the thread, how what is the actual size that is drawn? I guess. Uh huh. more 
updates for educational material and pre cat in general because point one seven I noticed is, is a lot different. I have to until we get around to some of that, but uh, that that takes a lot of time to learn some of those things. So I'm trying to spread out what I'm focusing on a little bit. Hopefully a little bit more Python. I haven't been uh, focused on that as much, but just kind of spread out what I'm what I'm doing to some extent because there's still a lot of stuff that I need to learn in, in FreeCAD. I think that sometimes the, the way that I'm drawing stuff is still difficult to come back in it. I find you know mostly because I think it's simple to begin with, but it's just like with code. Don't have documentation to it enough, then you don't remember what you're doing when you come back to it later. Mm -hmm. Is there an easy way to document, like how uh, record the, like the logic of how a part is made, or what are your thoughts on that? Um, the parts, well, some of it is just entering more metadata, better labels, even just in the tree in FreeCAD. It's a simple part, you know, and you start out with cylinders and things, but just labeling stuff. Sometimes you just have to spend more time entering metadata and better labels on things. And that, that could be in the sketches, too. Sometimes I do try to label uh, more of the sketches and pads in each step. Although sometimes that's a little bit redundant, but it, it, you have to kind of think about kind of information. And it, and it takes time. The more data entry you do, the more time or anything. And it would be better, of course, so no, but it's, it's free, free kind of still very beta, really. It, it, it is beta. It's, uh, they're, they're permanent a lot, but it's, it's a lot of functions, too, that can be automated yet in FreeCAD where it... Um, labels things or it has I think there's room where they can automate more stuff. I was thinking about that before in relation to how um, let's see some of the some of the functions in the tree work are actually especially in the assembly two work mix which I think is pretty well deprecated at this point. We're gonna have to move on to something different. Everybody else will too probably that assembly three but um, it the constraints and the way it handles that is very Makes lots of constraints, so there's two constraints. Okay. Oh, yeah, hold on. Hold on a second. But Let's. It uh, label very well. Hey, Abe, let, let me go back to what we d did a lot last year. I mean, uh, given that state of the assembly workbench, I think it's really good to uh, break down the thing as much as we can. Once again, modular design. So, keep indiv what if you keep try to keep individual files in the part library for the, the power cube and then. Just like we did last year, the, the main idea from last year was we have a final assembly, but each individual part is saved in a positionally correct fashion. In other words, when you yes. upload a new file, it replaces it automatically. What do you think of that? Yeah, and that's what I finally did with the frame. I broke it off into a separate file module. Yeah. Sometimes that makes it hard to edit the different parts or measure things relates to each other because a whole file, everything is editable all in one file. I think this one, some people were saying two, but it, it speeds things up a lot. It eliminates a lot of the bugs and the problems with the assembly work. And some of that, if, if the workbench worked better, that simply two, so that if, if FreeCAD worked a little better, it wouldn't be so much a problem, but that that's an easy way to do it for our settings. Eventually, you, you kind of have to edit some things together at a certain point, but once you get past a certain complexity, you really do need to be break it into a module. Uh, sometimes you have to go back and edit the module separately and reassemble it all at time, but you know that that so far that that works better. Uh, right. At a certain point, module is just too too much, and there's too many constraints or, or whatever, and it doesn't work as well. So uh, separating it off helped uh, a lot. Actually, Absolutely. I mean, that's it, it yeah. Everything up because I basically deleted all the constraints and started back over because there's just too many bugs that built up in there. Extra right, and that's and yeah. And we need the individual parts anyway. So I mean, the full due diligence that we need to do anyway means that we have individual part files in addition to the overall files. So. I think there's really no shortcuts in, in, in terms of trying to say, oh, we're going to have this grand master file that's got everything because we've got the best software in the world. No, I mean, you don't really need the best software. You just need 
what FreeCAD already has and the ability to to work with individual files uh, and be adept at putting them together into larger assemblies by importing, like the thing that we were talking a lot about last year, which is just simply merging files into one document. I mean, that's the, still, as far as I know, the recommended workflow for FreeCAD, where you're merging files from simply other documents. Yes, the merging method is what I use for the simple. I merged the simple parts after I edit those separately into the file. Uh, some things I, I do kind of use the method, I think, Roberto that came up where the frame, for instance, doing everything I'm constraining to that part. Kind of, originally, when I said was, I was using assembly to, to import a certain part and then constrain everything to that because it lets you lock the part, that prevents the constraints from moving around chaotically or unpredictably. Uh, and and that, that works so far. And currently, the frame imported using this simply to the module separate that way I think it should update like if I make updates to that file uh, to the frame if I go back to edit it it should update that using the assembly to import function it should actually I don't think there's a button there you click it or it periodically updates automatically uh, or changes to that that way but that's the only part I do that way because the way you know the way the cube is, everything basically needs to be constrained to that frame to assemble it. So that, that's the way that works best. You just have to kind of think about um, the construction of the, the project. So, uh, so far, I think, I think that's working okay. And, and improvements in some of the, the like the assembly workbench will help a lot. Um, but so far, this method seems to be pretty fast. Um, right. So, um, what are your next yeah, steps? See, um, I'm, I'm working on correcting some plumbing parts and making different sizes of like these valves and things. And uh, they, some of that stuff is a little hard to generate. I think for like a plumbing workbench, I guess you could go to trouble making specialized code to generate different sizes of, of um, well, maybe flamingo or something to do that. But the ball valves. Some things, objects like that, are a little bit more complex parts to represent. So it's like I'm going to draw and then edit those a little more. But most of the plumbing is pretty simple. I just need to get in and assemble all that. Um, there's some other, let's see, different types of parts besides MPT. I've still got to draw those SAE. Well, there may be some SAE fittings, but I don't know that the sizes are right on those for what's already in the uh, part libraries. I'll check those, maybe edit. Uh, for those, how to get those done? Right. Or, well, um, I hope I use the the keep me to get around and study the the pipe bench more. But I haven't been to that so much because like parts. I, I think the pipe work bench, if I set it up right, it will generate some of these parts for me uh, without having to draw draw them by hand. Obviously, just because some of those fittings should be simple enough, they can they can be drawn by the part work. I don't know how um, complex. Some of those may be more complicated and more detailed, like uh, the quick disconnects, things like that. They're a little more complex if you want to put a lot of detail on them. But still, it could probably be done with the pipe board bench. We got the files, uh, drawings for all that, right? And it's just a matter of specifying the sizes. The, the basic shoots in there, but um, see the cube pretty close on mostly the, what's left is just assembling the plumbing. Mm -hmm. Trying to get a better idea of how that goes together. Um, I don't know how well I can draw a lot of the, the hoses. I can try more of that. But That's flamingo stuff. territory, oh, right? Flamingo? Uh, draw. Yeah, I, I haven't. Um, make a workbench, so I don't know how I can draw hoses or pipes between points, but I can try that. Definitely try that. I mean, that's what it's supposed to be good for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that could be interesting there. Um, get represented a hose in there. Although it might be a little too direct. I, I don't know how it... If it's, my guess is it's probably better at drawing a solid pipe instead of things like flexible hose. 
Yeah. Right, right. I mean, you have to... I think you probably have to approximate it as a bunch of 90 degree angles or whatever. And, yeah. Yeah, like this, um, it might need to be in the center more. like for example, if you look at my screen, this, this fitting right here with the engine being right back there, that's going to be really hard to tighten. Tighten, yeah. Okay. Remove yeah, so the engine a little back. Or... Yeah, that's that's a quick coupler that's shown on it. Which I don't know. Um, yeah, we could use it. No, we don't. I don't think we want to. Yeah, we. Could, I don't know if we need a quick disconnect on the cooler. I'm not sure. Think about that. We could, Some we could do it. Two, I, I, try to, I think I stripped down basically the, the bill of materials pretty well in the spreadsheet. I think that there's some of that stuff that was listed before may not be used again. A lot of it is not, I know. And then there may be some other things. Uh, I think certain bolts that were used there before will be different this time and so on. So there's a lot of details to it. Yeah. The top one is okay, but the bottom one has to be between the two two pipes on the cooler. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, could that could be okay. Just one comment there. Uh, I do notice, like when when I had the micro track running, when you throttle down, like when you go into a lot of resistance, the engine can vibrate. Uh, probably up to like on the rubber mounts when you hit like against its limit oh. in some places it vibrates I would estimate up to like three quarters of an inch because of the nice rubber couplers like we got these big rubber feet 
unless they're super tied down. The engine can vibrate quite a bit, which is fine because you're preventing wear, but the way you have it right now, it would hit the, hit the cooler if it moves, if it vibrates. Because the cooler is fixed, the engine is going to shake back and forth, if, depending on how you mount it on a rubber feet. They do, and they can still, yeah, we yeah, just have to pay attention to that, because you, yeah. So, yeah, I think I have rubber feet in there that are an inch tall right now. Inch tall. Be, that's yeah. Much. I think those are an inch represented in the cat there, but, um, yeah, I'm going to have to shift those balls. Yeah, it seems like you move around quite a bit. Yeah, I'm going to have to shift the engine back a little from the cooler then to vibrate forward, side to side. Um, yeah, those are one inch. Yeah, that could be an issue if, it, um, if it's moving around a lot, yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah, uh, that's a little detail we got to take care of. I'm thinking, is there a way we can... It would be to probably get rid of this quick cup on top of that. Uh, Right. Um, being able to bolt it with the firmer mouse right to the front would be better if it wasn't in the plumbing and obstructing it on that side. So, I'm going to end that quick coupling would be good. Um, yeah, or maybe pushing the quick couplet back from a 90 or something on top of that. But yeah, it looks like there's room for the engine to go to the right. So, that, that should eliminate some problems with the plumbing around the uh, cooler in front there. Your snow. Inch. Shift right. Um, let's see what else. Questions on the monkey sheet. Twenty inch. Huh. I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking if, because there's 20 inch space going back for the depth of the engine and 20 inches side to side, maybe we we flip the engine 90 degrees. Do we ever consider that? Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a whole different okay. game, but... I'm, th I'm definitely seeing the issue on that one... Yeah, I mean that this coupler here, we cannot get at it with the engine in place there. Um, yeah, it, it looks like it could shift, the engine could be shifted to the right and in more than an inch, right? Okay. Maybe two. Um, yeah, yeah, possibly so, there, yeah. And, and yeah, that I, should be, should be doable, yep. I guess the question is whether on the cooler, whether it's better to have hose flexing into those connection points from the cooler, I mean, for 90 on there, no point. Um, I, I, I'm assuming the cooler is positioned well right there for, for airflow yeah. on the engine enough. And yeah. The holes and everything should be good enough. Um, yeah. That's pretty close there, so. Yeah. I think I think the frame is pretty good. There, there might be, you need to edit some of the holes, like the engine mount point and all that, but. Frame module should be pretty static at this point. Yep. Uh, let me just be a little bit more um, finicky. Not get all these plumbing parts in here because I mean, the, the, the more difficult part may very well be plumbing uh, to the uh, between the other cubes. That but some of that's. You know, that, that kind of almost got to be judged with a certain amount of practice. Um, it's hollow, so it's flexible, so just kind of estimate it. Uh, I think definitely need to get this cube done because I think there's a bit of work to do on the tractor itself figuring that out. So before we're going to have to 
Yeah. As far as yeah, I'm looking at the the cutout, the notch out. You can make that. Uh, if you look at my screen, looks like you got. Wait, is that no? Yeah, you, you might need all that space in that notch out. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Well, we're slipping it out the side. Yeah. 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 So that, that yeah, it's probably a lot easier with two people, right? So, um, for sure. Uh, well, engine's not too heavy itself. I mean, it's if you have it on a yeah. flat surface, you can kind of slide it out flat. almost. <clears throat> I'm assuming that you probably take the pump off before you take the engine out. You disassemble the pump, or well, well. Yeah, I, I kind of assuming some of the assembly, I guess the way to look at it is putting the engine in. I mean, the first step is putting the engine in the front of this bill, and then sometimes it's easier to probably assemble the, kind of the pump to it before you put it in there, but um, that also makes getting the whole thing in there a lot more difficult. Uh, if you move the suction lines lower, then you probably don't have to take out the pump when you take out the engine. Can you make them all low at the same as the lower level? Or is there any issue with that? Right. Yeah, let's do that. Because then you don't have to... It's going to be easier to take out the engine. Yeah, I mean, the main thing we want to allow for is that easy take in and out of engine. That's like yeah. that's the part that's that, if you're talking about longevity, that's that's the thing we're gonna that's the main service point. Yeah, well, taking the engine in and out is it a frequent? No, thing? no, but it is a thing that when you do have to do it, it's like you want it to be easy yeah. and not a frustrating thing. Yeah, yeah, because it's hard to probably work on it a lot while it's inside the frame if you've got extensive maintenance to do. So. Uh, yeah. I'm thinking like even if it's you know say you use it hard for like if you really use this thing I mean it'll only last like a year or two you know so before you gotta like serve like replace the engine or fix it or whatever yeah um, like say yeah Oh yeah, talk about oil changes. Uh, put in the location of the oil plug. That's a that's important. Yeah. That's that needs to be the yeah, we need to yeah, throw to that, throw in. that in. I think it's on one side and the other side. The accessible yeah, side. I think No, no, you fill in from the top. No, wait. How do you do it? Uh, you uh, fill in. Well, Where is that I thing? There's a photo of it somewhere. How do we fill that? Um, I think there were two, like, orange plugs. On yeah, those are both hole. drains. Yeah. The fill is, um, 
forget what a pill is. Oh yeah, it's, it's oh yeah, okay, yeah, you actually gotta draw the fill, because we, we, that can be like somewhere inaccessible. Okay, okay so fill and, and drain, we gotta add that. And also you should, uh, just, just a marker for the pull cord, which is right now, it's on, um, The pull cord right now is on. Where is it? It should be on the green on, one. On the right. It's that black this one? spot. I, I put a black spot on the front of the. Oh yeah, uh, there. That, yeah. The panel there is black. Yep. I figured I'd draw. Uh, it would be good to draw uh, detail in there, but I, I, I colored it black. Just to remember where that is. I think it comes out of that. Right. Oh, okay. Right. These engines are pretty good. When you pull it out like halfway, even it still starts easily. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That'll improve whatever we shift when I shift the engine to the right. Yeah. Um, shift those engine mounts right. That'll be better. Um, okay. Okay. So yeah, so I shift the engine to the right and the oil markers on that. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Yeah, I think um, I think that's really on the cue for now. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Keep going at it. A lot of detail here. Um, yep. It would be nice. Uh, I was thinking about water. Um, what's this cube is related to water? If you talk about any parcel of land, um, like here, it's very interesting. But the by the CD home, the pond there is completely drained, empty. Last year was full at this time in the spring. This this spring we got no rain. We got to do some ponds here, and that's that's how you're gonna get ten times more plants to grow. Actually, uh, we don't have any ponds on the site, but that's the relevance of uh, you know say 80 horsepower and up. That's that's good enough to get you bulldozing activity for a pond. So uh, that's this is related to it. So I was kind of thinking, yeah, let's. Let's get the bigger machine that could actually do some earthworks here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, the way they do it is uh, that's bulldozer territory. You kind of use the earth that you dig out to, for the dam. Uh, you can do small lakes, small ponds with with back hose, but that's once you want really want some water nobody does that with an excavator that's all bulldozer territory yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. there's a lot of ponds put around here but it's sometimes harder to find places where there's enough clay yeah to, uh, push one out, yep We've got plenty close. here uh -huh. um, yeah. okay let's continue on here so let's see anything else so Ruslan do you wanna uh, continue a little bit on on I see the exciting OSC part library workbench. You want to tell us a little bit more about that? Please do. What exactly does it do? <laughs> Sounds like you're up to something good. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Have a workbench with a uh, toolbar and then uh, several buttons. 
Uh huh. And then you click on the button, and you have um, uh, a window, like for example, one you just showing. Uh huh. Yeah. What it does is it looks very similar for, to the Python code page, but instead of having dimensions or code, the key, you have pass. <laughs> you have pass to uh, the pictures. And yeah. When Yeah. But now, now I have some problem to sort parts. It doesn't uh, work well. Right. So, hmm. <clears throat> so you would have a, a button that you can select parts. It wouldn't be individual buttons for different parts. Uh, or how do you? I, I can show it. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. By the way, this is you keep from Oliver. Yep. And Oliver also made some uh Oliver made uh, images for the parts. Yeah. And yep. It was very easy to integrate. Yep. Uh, and then you click OK, okay and the parts should be sorted. Yeah. So yeah, no that's here. good. Very good. But nevertheless, this is the part. And no, that's pretty good. Um, and and the idea is these parts, when you make a workbench, so for example, we could do um, a workbench like that. How does this, so you're doing, you're doing the, uh, the work of, say, for example, these UniPro kit parts, how how much difficulty is there for another person to actually create their own workbench using this? Okay, uh, I, I will, uh, this is uh, just for experimental parts. Yeah. We have a uh, part from our 3D printing uh, printer. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then we have 3D printing parts. 
Yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. And then you have a CSV field uh, on the left side. You have the notation is on the left side is keyword, on the right side from uh, column you have a value. Yeah. You have a table with a CSV table with a name table in 3 d CSV. And then you have other fields like the new uh, title, tooltip. Yeah, yeah. And you, you add these, these parts. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. This is the only thing you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you will get a toolbar. Yeah. And uh, you adjust uh, this CSV file. Very nice. And you can put a, as many items in the toolbar as you like. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I think it would be so nice to have a toolbar that's got so like all these parts. So, so the design procedure is like like we could even design workbenches where there's as many parts as corresponding to the actual design steps. So you know, for example, that if you clicked on every single one just in the order that there are you actually have at the end of the day come up with a full machine for example that would be one way to make super simple design workbenches which which carry the logic you don't have even have to think you know that you just got to put one of each part to make a complete machine so the logic could be an actual menu you know what i mean Yeah. But uh, there are some limitations, uh, artificial limitations. But uh, I'm, I try to keep these two as simple as possible, and you have only part and the image uh, in mm -hmm. the table. And you don't have uh, some additional fields where you can change size. Yeah. Or you have, a, you have some kind of tree structure. Of course, you can have a different file structure within a special order, uh, but nevertheless it's pretty flat. It's not like you click one yeah. button and then you have another button and then another button. Right. And uh, the reason is feature grid. Yeah. I don't want to create a free cat inside the free cat. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's fine. That's good. Uh, and the file that you import, uh, how do you generate those? You can select those to be in whatever position, or does it always put it at the origin? Can you... Yeah. 
Yeah. And I, I want to. Uh, Stephen has a different version of this. Uh, it, uh, his uh, work page it, uh, does not depend uh, on assembly work page. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he knows better than me how it works. But I, for some reason, I have some very strange behavior. I need to find out what is going on there. Yeah, yeah. The uh, only. Yeah. Only thing I would like to add in a feature request here is that whatever part we import, we can import it in a given location or basically like the same way that the merge function works. I don't know how the merge function works. Yeah, the way it works is when you so-called import or merge it saves the position, it understands the position of the original part. So it won't put it at the origin, it will put it where it was in the original document. So I don't know if you can maybe take a look at that a little bit because that, that would be um, pretty important as a feature to have in this, just the way the fundamental architecture of this. Yeah. I Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, some, some parts are complex. They contain, uh, they are from multiple different parts. And if you don't keep the good way, right. then you will get some, uh, some kind of very strange uh, heap of uh, files yeah. on, on, the, on a single point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I could see it being even foreseeable that this this workbench could be used as an instructional workbench. Like, for example, if you want to, yeah, it's just another different way of, it's almost like navigating a tree view, but you click on the different parts to show them and make them disappear when you're explaining how, how something works, for example. That could be another application, which would be... Um, I think useful. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's good. Um, yeah. So if you could just just look into the that we understand how how the imports are made, so we make sure that we can have control over the positional location. That's just the only thing we need to make uh, sure on this. Well, like oh, just just that you import it in a way that wasn't an original file, like it doesn't collapse at all to the origin or something like that. But as far as modification, like changing positions, I think we can use regular FreeCAD for that. Just, as you said, don't build another FreeCAD within FreeCAD. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But basically what we're getting out of this is, okay, there's a visual representation of all the parts, and the ability to pull on them readily so you can make compositions of parts uh, to, to, for design purposes. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yes. Yep. I, I don't think I've even run point one eight because 
um, I'm using point one six, but I use point one seven. I know one thing I was looking at recently was um, the, the coordinate system. Because I wasn't, I couldn't remember certain things about that. And I think that some of that has changed in point uh, one seven, mostly just in relation to the part design workbench. Some improvements there, but I, I think the the same the system applies. Coordinates are. There's a coordinate system for like each part that's uh, separate, and then when you have like coordinates for the parts of it, you have like global coordinates. The global coordinate system, it, it translates the position of the part into the global coordinate system. Uh, the way I understood that, that still should work. There's like multiple coordinate systems, but one is really just a translation. It's just the math that translates the position. And it doesn't change the original coordinate system, I guess, of the, of the part uh, itself, which I guess you can, but um, normally you're just kind of translating the part in the global coordinate system. Um, I don't know. I, I think I know All right. I guess, I guess the other concern with the workbench is the assembly to workbench is, is um, you know, replaced by the assembly three eventually. But I, I think I'm just going to have to stick with point one six for, for some things until I figure out better instructions for using point one seven. Um, we need more tutorials on that, but. And, and that may come with, eventually, if we have somebody to update the, um, the LSC uh, ISO, the, the whole software package, because that's technically, I think, what we're basing, what software we use on. Although, the problem with that is we're constantly creating new software all the time, and, and so it is difficult if somebody's just going to use the, uh, if you're just constantly booting the, the, the LSC uh, Linux off of a stick and it's not persistent, that it makes it hard to download all of these new software packages. And since we're constantly developing that stuff, that, that's kind of hard, which is why I usually only use it in a, in a VM or boot it off of a stick. I'm just trying to keep my software um, consistently compatible as all. So. constantly test with, with new software and the software is always improving. So and I also will uh, uh, I, I, my idea is to take the uh, the import code uh, from uh, assembly three part and uh, and try to understand it and use it uh, directly. I think that is how Steam did it. his code it looks very very similar to uh, assembly two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, always good to re reuse code that's, that's there. I mean, it won't, it's probably part of the code that's not 
not going to be, uh, you know, a problem in the future. I mean, there may be some issues with Assembly 2 in the future, and it's, we'll view it as kind of buggy, but, yeah, that part of the code is probably fine. It's open source, right? So, um, might as well use that function. But for now, I haven't even troubled how to open a document and close a document without my uh, uh, main uh, document window to, uh, to change uh, suddenly for some reason to change size. I need to I need to find out what's going on. I have uh, some guesses what I do wrong, but I, I need to perform some uh, a couple of experiments and uh, until it will uh, it will be useful. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. So, uh huh. You asking Jen to explain that? Hey, um, I found the, the current um, book of like universal plumbing codes for the U.S. online, like called the library. But I think that Ruslan needs like more specific diagrams, is my understanding. And so I looked online and found our local um, technical college that does plumbing. But it looks like I'd be better to go through like a local union. And as soon as we're done with the meeting, I'm gonna. Um, Try calling like local unions and guilds and see what I can find out about like what standard fittings are that are used. That seems to be the way that we're going to have to go with that, and it'll give me an opportunity to talk about the really exciting project we're doing. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Is that what? Yeah, Ruslan, is that what you were? Is that what you were thinking? Is that what you were wanting me to say? No, I would. You, you said more than I expected. <laughs> you're really enthusiastic about it. Uh, uh, well, I, I, I'm, very, I'm very excited about this project, and I do not have up to speed developer skills, so anything I can do to help developers while I'm developing my developness <laughs> is real to do. And you're really working hard on this, and I'd love to help with the, with the, with the analog kind of grunge work. It's not a problem. The document which you found is uh, uh, uniform plumbing code. Yeah. Uh, uh, uniform. Uh, yeah, plumbing code. Uh, I will check it if I will have some information. But I think already uh, there are some interesting information. Maybe it could contain interesting information for you, much. Uh huh.
a little harder to find and they may vary from manufacturer to manufacturer uh, a little bit depending on how, how they're making them but it's the in fittings that should be static uh, things like the threads and all that for each pipe uh, type and I, I was wondering about the legal on the licensing too if uh, I think some of that stuff is going to be kind of public record and demand and everything. It should be readily available, but I suppose that they have books and things that they share that they probably charge for, and the information may be public, um, and you can access those books different places. They probably try to sell those books, and there's probably certain license on that, but the, the information has to be public, so that should mean that we can just copy or make our own tables and, and books of all the, the data and uh, the data will be, you know, the Creative Commons, I guess, right? So, it's really good to pay for the standards. So, for example, for ISTDM, also for uh, ISO and also for GIN norm or European norm, uh, but the URI right, will can just Probably we cannot uh, make it uh, make publicly available the copy, but there is uh, no problem, I, I suppose, if I will look for the standards and then uh, create a, uh, a sketch or uh, use the same uh, the same name for dimensions, for example, uh, like uh, in, in a lot of catalogs, uh, uh, letter M is used for outside diameter or the uh, ISDM standard, um, which is uh, this is standard uh, number D two seven four nine. And you have a definition like M is outside the diameter of the hub. L is length over all coupling. It's in soft length. Uh, this, this kind of information. Uh, if it's not enough for, for me, but uh, it's, it helps. Yeah, so you're, you're mostly concerned with the standard labels. Yes, uh, it, it will make my uh, my drawing consistent, and also if you have a consistency in, in your software, it will make uh, easier. You know, for example, yeah. if, if, if you have an outer, if you use a le uh, letter M for outer diameter of the fitting, uh, and then you go to elbow, and suddenly it is, there is a different letter. And you go to T and you have third letter. And then you look at your catalog from local manufacturer and it's another letter. And it will be horrible. Um, you spend too much brain activity for, uh, for looking up. Yeah. And uh, you waste your, um, your time and your energy. Standardized more than it should have with future code possibilities and, and compatibility to other codes and might follow the standards. Uh, yes. Uh, I also talked about uh, uh, open standards. But this is the future. Uh, maybe uh, from a particular point of view, this Standard. Yeah, the whole argument about new new standards, yeah. Um, they can open source find the standard for everything. I, I don't know if there's an open source standard for plumbing in particular, I don't that is necessary. I like it. Oh, you, at least you have a standard for power cube. That's right. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good. Uh, it's kind of like frustrating that you're trying to find out what the 
code says or how the thing is made and you got to pay for the actual standard um, that's how they, I guess they can support themselves but that should be public info and that's and free there are also in the software industry a lot of companies which are usually competition competitors or the market for some reason they decided that they, uh, areas they, they join forces and create standards for, for servers uh, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe uh, for some infrastructure Yeah, that sounds good. I got to get going here, though. Um, let's let's wrap up the meeting. We've been at it two hours, but uh, I give a challenge. Can somebody find any any hints on our biodigester and the uniform plumbing code? Well, they may not have that yet, but they will in the open source future. <laughs> we'll see. But um, let's see. Anything else before we wrap up here? Uh, um, just to yeah let's let's close up here so we've got a um, work cut out on a power cube still working on it yeah good job on a free cad workbench work ruslan that's really good really useful um and hopefully we can get you possibly to teach in the immersion program maybe we could have you pipe in because i'm gonna have a lot of people piping in for like a, a session here and there on the different topics that we learn if you could um think about presenting for that that would be great on the on the workbenches or we can work on that together or I can present or or something but yeah I want to teach people about this once we get really good at this so yeah other than that I think I think we're pretty good to go uh, anything else yeah yeah um yeah i mean the specific question is it's like ask professionals yeah ask professionals but what what exactly is our question we we probably have to say okay what what's i mean are there specific questions that we have for them because uh, i'm not sure we can say hey plumbers tell me about the plumbing code what what Yeah. 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 I guess uh, it boiled down to some specific naming convention. So if you've got, I guess you probably have to provide Jen with some very specifics as you're doing the workbench there. So uh, please coordinate there. And that would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That sounds good. So yeah, let's let's um, leave it at that. Uh, thanks, guys, for a good meeting, and we'll continue, and we'll see you next week, 2 p.m., next Tuesday. Bye-bye.